It is as necessary for me to be as vigorous in condemning the conditions which cause persons to feel that they must ga engage in riotous activities as it is for me to condemn riots. I think we've got to see that a riot is the language of the unheard. And what is it that America has failed to hear? I think America must see riots do not develop out of thin air. Certain conditions continue to exist in our society which must be condemned as vigorously as we condemn riots. How many summers like this one do you imagine that we can expect? Well, I would say this, we don't have long. The mood of the Negro community now is one of urgency, one of saying that we aren't going to wait, that we've got to have our freedom. We've waited too long. So that uh, I would say that every summer, we are going to have this kind of vigorous protest. My hope is that it will be nonviolent. I would hope that we can avoid riots because riots are self-defeating and socially destructive. I would hope that we can avoid riots, but that we will be as militant and as determined next summer and through the winter uh, as we have been this summer. In the final analysis, a riot is the language of the unheard. What is it that America has failed to hear? It has failed to hear that the plight of the Negro poor has worsened over the last few years. It has failed to hear that the promises of freedom and justice have not been met. It has failed to hear that large segments of white society are more concerned about tranquility and the status quo than about justice, equality, and humanity. And I think the answer about how long it will take will depend on the federal government, on the city halls of our various cities, and on white America to a large extent. Hi, I'm Dr. Eric Clavel, and thank you for joining us for this edition of the Clavel Report, where we will talk about protests to policy. What was gained from the summer of 2020? You just listened to a montage of clips from the late, great Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., where he was discussing the reasons for civil unrest. He was also discussing in various speeches and in interviews by the Kalen Civic Academy the advantages and the disadvantages of civil unrest. And during that time period, you'll notice that the word riot was used interchangeably but we're calling it civil unrest here on the Clavier Report. As we take a look at the summer of 2020, protest to policy, what was gained from that summer? We understand through protests during the summer, it brought monumental awareness to historical problems facing the poor, facing African-Americans, and other black and brown underserved communities where there was healthcare disparity, food deserts, outright discrimination, oppression, suppression, or police misconduct, the world, our, our country, our states, our cities, our towns, our communities, even our relatives were put on notice. But the question becomes, what results did it yield? Now, let's talk about what actually took place during the summer and what were the historical and disparities that we were made aware of, we were put on notice of. If you're African-American, if you're Black, if, you, if you're Hispanic, if you're from a brown community, uh, poor, or from an underserved community, what I'm about to talk about is something that we, we live or we've seen, or our families have lived. You know, I always say that even if you have certain advantages as African-Americans, you know, which some of us have, and, you know, we grow up to a certain degree, our children now have a lot more, you still have somebody in your family who was experiencing these types of disparities 
this type of discrimination, this type of oppression, suppression, this type of ignoring or the ignoring of their problems if it wasn't you. The summer of 2020 hit us fairly hard. It really started in March of 2020. You know, I like to call it the winter. You know, the spring, it started the spring, but it felt like a winter because that's when a chill came over our country, came over our communities because of COVID-19. Not because we haven't dealt with these before, and I'm not going to go into it and belabor the point because we know we've discussed it on a Claville report. We've discussed it on Luis and Claville. For those of you who listen to our radio program, Stay with the Water, or hear our commentary, the Claville report, uh, on another view with Barbara Ham Lee, where we first started as a commentary, you know that this virus metastasized and was allowed to run rampant because of bad policy. Okay. Very bad policy. Bad policy by the former president. Bad policy by individuals in Congress, representatives who were elected to protect their communities, but were more loyal to a one-term president. Allow this to run rampant. This is what happened. So we know that this wasn't something that started over time, but it, it, it was ramped up and it was allowed to run wild because of bad policy. But with that, the pandemic we experienced, it allowed for the uncovering of problems that we've always faced in healthcare, healthcare disparities and discrimination. In other words, when the money stopped flowing, when the resources stopped flowing, when the ability to buy and sell, travel to and fro, work, and the ability to even barter for a living was no more. We saw who had and who did not. We call it the haves and the have nots. The covers were pulled off, over, pulled off of who could get healthcare. It was pulled off of who gets ignored when they go in for healthcare, even when they have the resources, they have the insurance, they have the pedigree, they still get ignored. And over and over and over again, we saw that it was black and brown people. I remember a story of a state representative in one of the Midwest states who basically had to go to several hospitals and basically would not be was not going to be seen unless she stated, I am a representative. In other words, she had to hold her position up to say, you're going to serve me. If not, I'm going to have a hard time or you possibly die. How many people can say that? How many African-American and African-American women could have done that? Only a handful. But that shows you the policies of discrimination and healthcare disparities that were always existing, but the covers were pulled over. COVID-19 pulled the covers back. We also saw not just in hospitals, emergency rooms, hospital stays who had insurance who did not, who was accepting the Affordable Care Act, also known by the popular name of Obamacare. But we also saw when the vaccines came out, the life-saving vaccines, when they came out, which communities had access to those vaccines first? Now, keep in mind, there were story after story after story, headline after headline after headline. Zoom talk, town hall after town hall. You know, I don't know about you, but I got tired attending so many town halls because it was the same story over and over again that we've lived or heard or deal with. But of course, for those communities that had not, it was very important to them. But still, there was fatigue there. But there was also hope and optimism that finally, finally, these issues that we've been facing over and over again they're, they're not only heard, but we're going to get policy. And again, I want you to key in on that policy, that word policy. We're going to get policy to help correct it. Lo and behold, when the vaccines rolled out, it either did not stop in the Black communities as they should have, or they rolled right past it. We see from the statistics 
that even vaccines that were meant for African-American or black or brown or poor or underserved communities, however you want to characterize them, even when the vaccines were meant for them, they still didn't get to them. They went to the more affluent or mainstream communities, more white communities, even something that was meant for them. They weren't able to get it. The education of about, about the vaccines, about the virus, about healthcare, how to protect yourself. The message was being missed or they were forgetting to even talk to those communities. Again, the summer 2020 revealed that. And that was part of the protest. That was part of the protest. And I also want to just mention maternal health. Maternal health for African-American women, where we saw that more so more often than not, Black women, when giving birth, are more apt to be admitted to ICU along with their babies or even die giving childbirth. Something that we've perfected over time as to be more routine. Again, anytime there's a health uh, procedure, healthcare procedure, surgical procedure, there's not, no such thing as, as perfection. But I mean that the process, I mean the education, the know-how, you know, over time. But Black women still seem to be at a higher risk of being in these terrible, terrible situations. And I would just like to pay homage to the Black women who were purchased as property as slaves by the father, who we know today as the father of gynecology, who experimented on those women for the sake of better procedures for all women, but only, it seems that only white women and women who have access and privilege are getting the advantage of these procedures. But I pay my respects to those women who bear the greater pain who bear the greater burden that was thrust upon them involuntarily, but they paid the price. So I pay my respects to them. So when we talk about protests, we talk about the disparities of healthcare, discrimination. We also now are forced to look at, we were forced to look at discrimination in employment. When the summer of 2020 hit, COVID-19 push, pro, push people out of their office. They push people off of their jobs where they were making minimum wage, what we call just getting by wage or staying under wage as opposed to a living wage. These individuals were not able to work. Now, thank goodness that the stimulus came through to provide these individuals with unemployment and plus a kicker or bonus. But how many people were left hanging? hanging it on by a shoe thread, uh, uh, by, by a thread or a shoestring before it came. And how many billion people went under? Still today, some people have not received their addition of stimulus dollars. And where are they now? How many home foreclosures are waiting to be foreclosed because of the forbearances that were received or the moratoriums that are now coming due? This is what the summer 2020 brought out. This is what protests were about. But also, not just the employment situation where many people were pushed into the gig economy and forced to work as independent contractors without the protections of the workplace for, employee, for employees from the employers that normally would pay for health care benefits, that normally would pay for retirement benefits, that normally would pay for time off, maternity leave, and the like, and pay a salary or a living wage, an hourly living wage. These people were forced out. So the summer 2020 protests through COVID-19 uncovered these issues. They said, wait a minute, less it's time to deal with this. Not only that, but as far as education goes, with our children and broadband and access to affordable internet. Now, the internet now is no more like it was back in the 80s, the 90s, or the early 2000s. Every single home, the internet should be a part of everybody's utility bill. It's just that important. It's just that vital. It's like having running water in your home to be for sanitation purposes. You got to have it. 
it's common sense policy now that the summer 2020 uncovered. Now, these seem to be small things, but these issues impact our lives every day. And we saw it. It came about in 2020. But what galvanized Black Lives Matter in education, Black Lives Matter in corporate America, Black Lives Matter in in voting, but Black Lives Matter pure when it comes to police misconduct. This is what pushed the world to the streets, the world to stand up and take notice. Not just the United States, not just in Minneapolis with the murder of George Floyd, which now we can now call and blame on former officer and now convicted felon, Derek Chauvin. The vigilanteism against Ahmaud Arbery, the bad police work and police misconduct and murder of Breonna Taylor, the false allegations, again, against another black man by a white woman in New York. A man just wanted to watch the birds and just simply ask someone to please follow the rules. All of this was uncovered. And keep in mind, in the trial in the George Floyd for justice, the trial of state versus former officer Derek Chauvin, a now convicted felon, showed where even initially the police departments and the culture were complicit by not either not turning over information, changing information, or not putting the full report or the truthful report first. So it was more than just actions of one ruthless criminal officer, but it was a culture that was willing to protect it. The summer of 2020 brought those, the protests, to protest against all of those historical inequities, disparities to the forefront. We marched, we boycotted, we painted streets, we challenged the highest office in the land, we challenged local institutions and departments, we even challenged our relatives who thought differently. But what policy came out of it? Protests are good. And as Dr. King stated in the montage of, of clips that we just saw by Kaitlyn Civic Academy, we know that it has its purpose. But the purpose should lead toward common sense policy. I want us to take another look at a clip from NBC News, a historical clip of Dr. King speaking in Atlanta at historical now Ebenezer Baptist Church, where he discussed how you can't expect a strapless man to be pulled up by his boots when he doesn't have any, any straps. And this is where good policy comes in. Take a look at this clip. As an immigrant, somehow, not easily, but somehow got around it. Is it just the fact that Negroes are black? White America must see that no other ethnic group has been a slave on American soil. Uh, that is one thing that other immigrant groups haven't had to face. The other thing is that the color became a stigma. American society made the Negroes color a stigma. America freed the slaves in 19... I mean, 1863, through the Emancipation Proclamation of Abraham Lincoln, but gave the slaves no land or nothing in reality, and as a matter of fact, to, to get started on. At the same time, America was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest, which meant that there was a willingness to give the white peasants from Europe an economic base. And yet it refused to give its black peasants from Africa who came here involuntarily in chains and had worked free for 244 years any kind of economic base. And so emancipation for the Negro was really freedom to hunger. It was freedom uh, to the winds and rains of heaven. It was freedom without food to eat or land to cultivate. And therefore it was freedom and famine at the same time. And when white Americans tell the Negro to lift himself by his own bootstraps, they don't, oh, they don't look over 
the legacy of slavery and segregation. I believe we ought to do all we can and seek to lift ourselves by our own bootstraps. But uh, it's a cruel jest to say to a bootless man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. And many Negroes, by the thousands and millions, have been left bootless as a result of all of these years of oppression and as a result of a society that deliberately made his color a stigma and something worthless and degrading. I believe Dr. King summed it up for us. After the protest, what type of policy do we need? We have to understand that protest is good, is needed. It brings issues to the forefront. But in order to truly address issues that have plagued our people in other poor and what we call underserved communities for years, and we know that, as he said, the, at the time, the Negro or the African-Americans, have been plagued longer than any other group, but have received less than any other group to address those historical problems. It's funny, as we come close to Juneteenth, of course, we know June 19, 1865, uh, is known as Juneteenth because that was the last state of Texas, Galveston, Texas, where the slaves were free, two years after the Emancipation Proclamation. You know, led by, at the time, Major General Gordon Granger, who read... Uh, the general order number three that said that all in the state of Texas, all slaves are now free, given all rights, all rights and are equal to everyone in the state and given the rights that everyone else has. That was the gist of general order number three. But as Dr. King aptly stated, the Emancipation Proclamation, it started good. But of course, with the assassination of uh, Abraham Lincoln, and the lack of will, and of course the presidency of Johnson, and the lack of will by the Congress to move forward after Reconstruction. We're doing the time period of Reconstruction to, to extend it, to enforce it, to enact it. Uh, the, the policies that would have helped to turn the tide, turn the tide over 150 years ago, turn the tide of generations of African Americans who were left to hunger, you know, it was it was freedom, but freedom for what? Freedom to hunger, freedom to want more, freedom to work tooth and nail under unfair practices like sharecropping, freedom to continue to be uh, objectified by the criminal justice system, by the first, you know, b- believe anyone white over anyone black, the discriminatory policies of black servant on juries. And of course, if you got locked into the criminal justice system, then there was really no way out. The unjust policies, not just the economic, not just the criminal justice, but also the unjust voting policies of Jim Crow, of that era of 100 years of suppressing the right, the right, the right of African Americans to vote by creating these fictitious and ridiculous tests, such as guess how many jelly beans in the jar, or the literacy tests, or the poll tax, or the grandfather clause. These ridiculous policies that continue to ignore the letter of the law and the spirit of the law and circumvent it to create bad policies. These are the issues. These are the problems that we still face today. Protests should lead to common sense policy. So let's talk about what that common sense policy is. Let's talk about health care. There should be universal health care for all basic services in the United States for every single person. Europe has done it for years, years, and it's worked. You should be able to go to the dentist and have your teeth cleaned twice a year. You should be able to have fillings. You should be able to have Routine checks and x-rays of your teeth, routine. That should not cost a thing. Not only that, maybe the specialized services such as, you know, braces, then you have a cost there. But even that should not cost, (laughs) uh, that should not be the cost of a very good used car. And now it's approaching the cost of a very economical brand new car. Trust me, you know, we're having to pay those costs now. 
it also should be, as far as your eye doctor go, you should be able to get your ears and your eyes checked twice a year. You should be able to have the ability to secure a pair of glasses, corrective lenses, or hearing aids if needed. That should be something you should not have to pay for. That's common sense healthcare policy. When it comes to going to the doctor, you should be able to go to your doctor and receive a checkup once a year. For children, twice a year. If you're an adult, that once a year checkup. You should be able to secure medicines, medication of generic medicines for any ailment that you may have that is prescribed by the doctor as needed. And that should not cost you anything. You should be able to go to the emergency room or a community hospital or center and be treated without costing you your future, your life savings, your home, your your name in bankruptcy or reorganization because you can't pay a medical bill. That should not happen. That only can happen through universal health care, where we now create a tax structure where everyone pays a fair amount. Everyone pays a fair amount. I like how in in Christianity, God only asks for 10%. Whether you make a dollar, a hundred dollars, a thousand, 10,000, a hundred thousand, or a million, or in some cases in our world of $100 billion, God says, hey, just give me 10%. That's your tie. And your free will offer, you can give whatever you like, whatever is put on your heart to give for the good. That's it. He didn't have any lawyers having to go through it, writing loopholes and things of that nature. 10%, everyone. That's what you call a flat tax. Flat tax on every single person or corporation, which is also a person under the law, should have to pay. Just a flat tax. Even if it's a progressive tax, it should benefit those who have less as opposed to those who have more because they have less. We shouldn't put the honest on the shoulders of people who are working in the gig economy to support a nation where others who benefit from the gig economy, the shareholding, don't pay anything or are able to skate around it. Common sense tax policy to pay for common sense basic services of health care and education makes sense. It's good common sense. Universal pre-K. If a child goes to school just one year earlier before they get to kindergarten, at four years old, pre-K, one year, just one year, The statistics and the studies show the impact is monumental. The ability of that child to learn to comprehend at an age earlier just by one year, to be able to understand sentence structure, to write, to read, to do math, by one year can save our country billions in prisons, in police, in social programs, because we have a better educated, and if we look at, again, common sense, policies for healthcare, a healthier nation. Investing in school meals that are healthier and not as processed. This helps to help our local growers and increase the longevity and the health, improve the health of our nation. That's education, that's healthcare. Now, let's get to voting. Every single person, when they get their driver's license, should be registered to vote. Or when you turn 18, automatically you register to vote, just like selective service. Common sense, common sense. You have to go through any long drawn out process, automatically you are registered to vote. Now. How can you vote? We are, we saw the mail-in ballot system work. We saw 
the ability to vote, no questions asked, absentee, in person, work. It was phenomenal. My wife and I, we did it. We were able to walk into our registrar's office. We, it took maybe from the walking from our vehicle to voting to walking back to our vehicle, maybe 10 minutes total. It was the easiest and most enjoyable voting experience we've had in a long time. Now we can look at maybe voting online. Maybe. We'll, we'll, we'll see how that plays out. But being able to vote early, being able to be registered uh, as immediate, automatically, or when you get your driver's license, just like selective service, makes sense. Common sense policy. Then we have we don't have to deal with these partisan wars in, in, in our state houses and in Congress about you know elections and and election laws and policies that disenfranchise, do what North Carolina did and 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 move voting precincts and do what uh, Florida just, Florida governor just did, sign these restrictive laws, or even even Georgia and other places. We don't have to deal with that because protests to good common sense policy makes sense. Let's deal with unemployment. We must pass a living wage. We must give workers the ability to unionize. We must give the ability of workers to have a voice in how the policies affect them. If we do that, we find where workers are happier, they produce more, better quality, and companies last longer. If you have someone within a company or a CEO that earns 400 or 4,000% more than the lowest paid worker, you're going to have problems. You're going to have a have and have not problem, a disenfranchisement that simply can't keep up. We have to start valuing workers, again, as the cornerstone of our country, the people who built and continue to build our country. And finally, trust, accountability, transparency, collective and individual responsibility. This is the way we fix police and community mistrust. We've seen over and over again. We've talked about this before on Louise and Clavel on the Clavel Report and others where if you look at the civil and social unrest, what have been classified as riots before, we've seen where these days, week-long social uprisings, civil unrest, which cause damage to property, which cost the lives of citizens, most of them started with an interaction from the police and a person, a man, a black man or a woman of color. Think about that. Look at the watch, what we'll call the watch ride. Look at the long, hot summer of 1967, 68. Look at 2020. Look at Rodney King, 1991, 92, I believe. Look at those. And look what happened. Police stop, police misconduct, abuse. Look at George Floyd. It all started the same way. So if it started the same way, then how do we, there's got to be a universal problem to fix it. All politics is local, all policing is local. Keep that in mind. All politics is local, therefore all policing is local. But it starts by having an honest conversation acknowledging our mistakes, just like the brass on the stand of the George Floyd for just justice for George Floyd case where state versus former officer and their convicted felon, Derek Chauvin. They had another honest conversation. They got on the stand and said, this is where we made a mistake. This is where one of our own made a mistake. Not all of us, but this one right here. It was wrong. And obviously he's made that mistake more than once. But now there's a pledge to correct it and fix it. 
Common sense policies leads to good policies, leads to good results, both short term and long term. From protests to policy, what have we gained? We haven't gotten there yet, but these are, are the proposals that I believe will help us to get there if we implement them. Thank you again for joining us for this discussion on the Clavier Report. Join us next time as we bring and discuss current issues from a historical perspective, ensuring that they have an impact today and tomorrow and for generations to come. We'll see you next time.